Good morning. Back home in the woodshop today. Um, and we look at Acts chapter 9, verses 23 through 43 today. That's the finishes up chapter 9. But yesterday we witnessed the conversion of Saul to Paul. And, in, you know, he was preaching. Um, I mean, he became a believer and, and very outspoken now in his belief and, and, and very willing to share and to encourage others to believe in Jesus, just as he had been very zealous or very excited about arresting the Jews and no, or Jews, those who believed in Jesus. Now he was probably even more excited to share the news and to tell the news. And verse 23, as we begin today, it says, after some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. You know, I mean, and he's not in Jerusalem now. He's, you know, he's in Damascus or he's in, um, um, he's in the, the other areas uh, of, of, the, of the region. And he's preaching and teaching so, so much and encouraging so many to convert and to believe in Jesus that the, the leaders of the Jewish people, you know, begin to uh, want to put Paul to death because of his, because of his persuasive witness to Jesus. But verse 24, their plot became known to Saul, even though they were watching the gates day and night, some of Saul's friends, his disciples. So here, Paul now has disciples, people that are listening to and following Paul and and, you know, he, he has become a, a great spokesperson and people are, are listening and following. So some of his loyal followers lower him down over the city wall and, and he escapes. And then it says when he'd come to Jerusalem, uh, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. They were leery. They, you know, they, they were gonna use some extreme caution uh, because they they had heard so much about Paul Saul, and were a little bit hesitant to really firmly and completely believe his conversion. And if we look in the book of Galatians, first chapter, you know Paul as he's writing to the Galatians says that you know it was nearly three years after his conversion that he first went to Jerusalem. So I mean. And if that's the case, I mean, there should have been an awful lot of evidence to show that Paul was very sincere. But one of the disciples, Barnabas, took him and brought him to the apostles, or one of the believers, Barnabas, and and told them the story. I mean, I'm sure they had heard the story, but Barnabas spoke for Paul. Um, and, you know, and if you read different places, Saul was the his Roman name and Paul would have been the Aramaic name. So, um, you know, he's, he's one and the same person as Paul Saul, but as a Christian and as a, an apostle, one who's speaking for Jesus, we know him more as Paul and that's the way he refers to himself in the letters he writes. So he went in and around and amongst the, the believers in Jerusalem, it says, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, those Greek-speaking Jews that were, um, you know, maybe not quite so intent on their Jewish faith anymore. They were um, a little bit more worldly, maybe, I, I know. But, but it came to the point then that, you know, Paul was so persuasive and so adamant in his speaking to them that they decided that they needed to get rid of Paul, put him to death. And so when, when others heard of that, they uh, took Paul then to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. And, and if we read and, and things, we know that like, you know, one of his missionary journeys, he went to Caesarea and Tarsus and, and different areas that way. And then the, you know, verse 31 uh, sounds like everything is peaceful and calm for the Christians. It says, meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up, and the Holy Spirit increased its numbers. And, you know, it, it sounds 
idyllic. It sounds, you know, just like a wonderful place and time to be. And I'm sure in some ways it was, but there was still a lot of division, a lot of uncertainty in some of these new believers. Um, and now we, we turn, as we get into verse 32, from Paul to Peter. And it says, Peter went here and there amongst the believers, traveling down to the saints in Lydda. And there he found this man named Anus, who had been paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. And he goes to him, and, and in the name of Jesus Christ, he says, Anus, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. You know this? And it's Jesus Christ heals you. And it wasn't even by the power given to me by Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ heals you. And I mean, and Jesus was no longer living. Jesus, well, he was living in heaven, you know, his eternal life that way back in the place that he had begun. But, you know, it's, uh, so they were definitely preaching and teaching and using the name of Jesus uh, for so much good. And because of that, many of the residents of Lydda and Sharon uh, turned to the Lord and became believers. And there's a, a nearby town named Joppa. And then it tells us that there was a woman there named Tabitha, or in uh, the Roman name was Dorcas. So Dor Tabitha and Dorcas, again, same person, known by two different names. How, how many of us are that way? Um, he says she was devoted to good works and charity. She became ill and died. And the women, you know, washed her, prepared her body for burial, took her to an upper room. But these people hearing and knowing that Peter wasn't too far away, sent people to Peter and said, please come. Because this, this wonderful woman, and they sang her praises and, you know, and it says all the widows stood by weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that she had made for them. And, and then, kind of learning from Jesus, Peter puts them all outside. You know, he isn't going to do this miracle in the presence of everybody, you know, but he puts them outside, so it's, it's a, a more private and personal situation. He kneels down and he prays, and, then he, and so he, he prays, and then he turns to the body. So he's praying to God, he's praying to Jesus, and then after the prayer, after you know, consulting with Jesus, with God, with the Holy Spirit, then he turns to the body and says, Tabitha, get up. And he took her hand and helped her up. And, and she returned then to life. And people were filled with joy. You know, it says, and then this became known throughout the Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, Peter stayed with a man named Simon the Tanner. And this would have been a horrible thing for Peter to have done earlier. A tanner dealt with skins, dead skins. They were unclean. A tanner would have been one of the few, I mean, a person of very ill repute that any good Jew wouldn't want to hang out with a tanner. Just like, I mean, a tanner was a sinner, unclean. And if you were there, I mean, so it, it's, it's in a way showing us that Peter is going away from some of those Jewish beliefs and Jewish rituals and Jewish regulations and becoming more Christ-like in his acceptance and in his dealing with other people. And it's a reminder to me that, you know, we, we can't look at somebody else and say, I don't have time for them or they're not worth my time, or they're not worth talking to, G to them about Jesus. It's, you know, we need to be aware that each and every person has value. And, and just, you know, uh, it, it, do it doesn't matter if they're the President of the United States, a commercial airline pilot, uh, a fighter jet pilot, uh, a dishwasher. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with a dishwasher. Uh, you know, but each and every one is valuable to God. Yeah, and we, we see that in Jesus, and we see that in the disciples. And, and, and knowing that is just a reminder that I, too, <laughs> you know, am worthy of God's love and God's grace. You're included in that one or two. You, know, you are very worthy and very valued by God.